Hi there, this is Dr. Dave Hansen of Hansen Family Chiropractic, and you are tuned into our nutrition workshop, Hunger Games, Eating to Thrive, Not Survive. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are located in Batavia, Illinois, and we focus on pediatrics, family wellness, and pregnancy, which may be a little uh, different than your impression of what chiropractic is, since we uh, didn't mention anything about pain there. Uh, we do help people with neck, neck uh, pain, backaches, and headaches, but that's not our focus. Uh, we see a lot of kids, probably about two-thirds of our patients are children, uh, so we see a lot of ADHD, we see a lot of constipation, ear infections, things like that. We do work with adults as well, but uh, typically those are people that are looking to regain health health or they have a health issue that they're looking for and not simply uh, alleviate pain. Although we do help with that too. We have some upcoming workshops I wanted to let you know about if you're in the area. We're doing a live version of this Hunger Games workshop and on uh, March 3rd here at the office. And then a week after that, we're having a local farm come out to talk about the health benefits of eating naturally raised meats. And then in April, we're doing our Perfect Storm workshop. This is where we talk about the different causes behind neurodevelopmental disorders uh, like autism, ADHD, and the like. So join us if you can. But what we're talking about today is our health, because I think we would all agree that our health is our greatest asset, not only in our lives, but the, in the lives of the people that we love. Unfortunately, most people would say that they're not expressing their greatest level of health in terms of their potential. So the question becomes why, and the answer to that is what today is really all about. So why do we choose the donut instead of the apple? I mean, we know the donut is bad for us. But what most people don't understand is the devastation of eating that donut and the devastation of missing that apple. On a conscious level, people don't understand the consequences of our food choices. We've been marketed to death, literally, to believe that our choices don't matter. And we don't equate these foods with early death and cancer and ADHD and acne and depression and dementia and others. And we don't equate eating the apple with significantly reducing the risk of all those things and having a longer, better, healthier life. We think the donut you know, may pack on a few pounds, that it might make our egg kid act a bit squirrely for a little while, but in reality it's poison. Uh, we are the sickest species on the planet right now. No animal can match our rates of obesity, heart disease, cancer, depression, etc., or even get close to them. So the two most important questions that we have to ask ourselves are, why are we sick, and what do we need to do to get and stay well? Well, the prevailing answers as to why we're getting sick are bad luck, bad germs, or bad genes. But the truth is, we are sick because of bad choices that accumulate over time until they eventually catch up to us. And as long as you think that you're sick because of bad luck, bad germs, or bad genes, you feel that you have no power to influence your health, that it doesn't matter if you have the apple or the donut. Well, I'm here today to show you with the best science in the world that what determines whether or not you and your family are going to be sick or be well is based on how you eat, you move, and you think. So uh, a few decades ago, the fish in the Great Lakes started to die off. They were washing up on the shore, dead or dying, full of tumors, and were really just really sick. And the birds that were feeding on these fish were starting to have brittle eggs. They weren't reproducing, and they started to get worried that the birds were going to go extinct as well. There is no biologist in their right mind who would have blamed that on bad genes, that the solution is just to dump a bunch of medications into Lake Michigan or to set up tiny fish hospitals with little tools to perform surgery on the fish before they die. And it's kind of a funny idea when you're talking about fish, but why would applying that same way of thinking to humans make any more sense? It's, it's toxicity and deficiency that are at the root of all disease. And if you're toxic and deficient, your body is going to go into a state of adaptation because it wants to survive. So let's say, for example, your health is at a you know 6 out of 10. What is the only way you can get well? You have to move towards 10, right? So what does that? Drugs or surgery? It's an important question because maybe it's neither. Two things happen when we put a stress into our life. And a donut is a stress, by the way. The first thing is that we lose our lifespan. Our cells will actually start to divide quicker. We have more cellular damage and you actually decrease your lifespan. But more importantly is the quality of our life decreases. And life becomes more of a struggle just on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like being at the bottom of a pool with a backpack full of rocks. And I'm here to tell you that it, it doesn't matter what drug they give you when you're stuck at the bottom of a pool. The only thing that matters is getting the rock out of your backpack. And what I want to talk to you about today is taking control over what rocks go in and what rocks are going to take out. And understanding that there is nothing in the treatment of the issues that come from having rocks in your backpack that are ever going to solve the cause of those issues. And until we address the cause, we have no hope. 
And the cause is not bad germs, bad genes, or bad luck. It's bad choices that they put the rocks in her backpack. One of the best things terrorists could do is just build more fast food restaurants, maybe add another pharmaceutical company, have a couple more infomercials, and encourage people to eat the way they eat now. And everybody's going to be dead in 100 years. They can just walk right in, don't have to do a thing. One quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and three quarters of what you eat keeps your doctor alive. I used to get high for a living, and all the bullshit food is so mean. Cancer rates going up, heart disease going up, stroke going up. We're poisoning ourselves with highly processed, nutrient-depleted food. One of the major problems is what we do to the soil and the air and the water and everything we take in our food. We, for whatever reason, decided we're going to spray everything with every kind of pesticide, herbicide, larvicide, fungicide. We decided we're going to genetically modify things we don't know anything about. Can we actually improve what has already been created? And the answer is maybe, but not the way we've been doing it. If you want to know what's wrong, look down at the table. It's staring back at you. Think of it as chronic malnutrition, because that's what's going on. But if we think we're going to go to the doctor and get a pill for everything, we've missed the whole point. We have been taught our whole lives to be consumers of modern medicine, which is pharmaceutical medicine. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Now, the drug industry has every right to make money, no question about that at all. The ethics, I think, need to be very closely watched. What the pharmaceutical companies are doing may not necessarily be in the interest of our population. You can be as sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. Approximately 106,000 Americans die from pharmaceutical drugs each year. And these are people who took the medication as directed. There is a lot more turning to alternatives, because what's being done before you doesn't work. There is no magic bullet, but there is a lifestyle change that reverses serious chronic disease. It's cheap, it's simple, it's safe, it's effective. The solutions are here. They've always been here. Every single person in the world, every culture, every language, every person in the world knows it. You are what you eat. Food does matter. It's a choice. You don't have to be sick. I love that movie. It's called Food Matters. You can get it on iTunes, Netflix, Amazon. It's all over the place. It's awesome. It will tons of great information in there. All right, so this is everything we're going over today. It is a lot. Uh, just try to soak up what you can and get motivated to make some changes. So. I am a big fan of making things black and white. So everything, all the foods I'm going to go over today are either going to push you towards health or push you away from health. There's going to be no neutral foods, no food Switzerland. So the qualifications I'm looking at to see if a food is healthy or not is four things. One, it's got to promote a healthy psychological response. So what is it doing to your brain? Two, it's got to promote a healthy hormonal response, which is hugely important, especially if you're trying to lose weight. It's got to support a healthy gut. And lastly, it has to support your immune system and minimize inflammation, which is a really big problem nowadays. So let's break these down. One, your brain on food. So I'm going to tell you something you probably already know, and that's that dieting doesn't work. But what you may not know is that it's not your fault. And that's because human beings are designed just biologically, it's hardwired in to crave three things, and that's sweets, salts, and fats. Now, where we run into trouble is grocery stores are packed full of processed foods that were designed like in labs with guys wearing white coats to push our buttons, our genetic buttons that make us crave these three things. So they stimulate these uh, inherent desires in us that to crave these salty, sweet, and uh, fatty foods, and so it's it's really not fair because these foods are stronger than our willpower, and uh, I call them Franken foods because that's kind of what they are designed in a lab to <laughs> to destroy us all. Uh, but the, what they they do is they use them to discover what's called the bliss point. You may have read about this in the, in the news in the over the past couple of years. What the bliss point is, this is the point where it can uh, stimulate these cravings. 
uh, to maximize the effect that they get from them, but at the same time, minimizing any kind of satisfaction we get from eating these foods. It's like they're food with no breaks, essentially. Because we crave sweet things, naturally, because in nature, that's rare, and that means it's a, a good uh, source of nutrition, like fruit. And we crave uh, fat because that's an abundant source of energy. Get that from meat. And we crave salt because that's crucial to regulating our water levels. So these scientists figure that out and they are, are pushing these buttons. And it's frankly, it's just not fair. And that's what we get with these processed foods. Because really what it comes down to when I'm talking about food with no breaks is, you know, how do you know when you're full? You know, there's the obvious way of just your stomach is just physically so full that you can't fit in more in, you know, how you feel after probably a, a typical Thanksgiving meal. But obviously, you don't want to end every meal that way. Or there's no way you're not going to be obese, right? So the analogy I use with this one is Oreos versus uh, steak. So let's say uh, you're eating some steak. You know, it, it takes a little longer to chew it. Um, you start sending uh, chemical messengers to your brain that, hey, we're getting a lot of nutrition here. Once it starts getting into your stomach, it takes a little longer to break down, and your intestines will send messengers up to your brain just saying, hey, we're getting tons of fat, tons of protein, tons of carbohydrates, all this great nutrition. We don't need to eat anymore, and you push your plate away because you, your brain knows that you're full. Now let's contrast that with eating Oreos. Uh, these dissolve in our mouth and in our bodies very quickly, so they get just sucked right into our digestion. But there is like no nutrition uh, on in an Oreo, and so our body still craves more food because it's not getting the nutrients that it needs. So even though you might be eating the same mass in terms of you know space of Oreos as you are steak, you just never feel full until you eat like a whole sleeve, and then you feel sick probably because of all the sugar. But that's what I mean when terms of food with no breaks. Real food has things built into it to let you know when you're full. This fake food, the Franken foods, do not. So at the end of this workshop, I'm going to introduce a 30-day challenge, which I really hope that you will participate in, because at the end of it, you'll start to appreciate the natural flavors in real food. Your taste buds will reset themselves, and you'll realize how delicious fruits, veggies, and meats really are. And the pleasure reward centers in your brain won't be tied to those uh, super, you know, electrifying uh, Franken foods, but to actual nutrition and satiety. And you'll never again be controlled by your food, which is a very empowering place to be. And we're going to do that by changing the food on your plate. All right, so number two, hormones. This is a big one, especially if you're trying to lose weight. There's a whole bunch of different hormones, which are basically little like chemical messengers that take messages from one part of your body to another. Uh, but we're only going to talk about four today. Uh, the first one is insulin, which most people have heard of because, as it relates to you know diabetes. But what insulin is, is a storage hormone. So when you eat food, especially carbohydrates, uh, you know your body breaks it down into uh, in little, little individual sugars and they get absorbed in, into your bloodstream. Now you don't want the sugar just floating around in your bloodstream because eventually you end up with candy-coated organs and that's not good. So that's where insulin, insulin steps in. It takes those sugars and it packs away into cells. And it has two different options when it's packing the, these sugars away. The first is this, uh, we have different stores of sugars in our muscles and in our liver. Those are the sugars that we need right away. Like if we need a quick burst of energy, we have some just ready to go. And so the first thing that insulin does is it checks our liver and our muscles to see if we're topped out. As soon as we are, it packs the rest away as fat. So what I need you to, to take away from that is if you're eating an excess of carbohydrates, your body is constantly tapped out on your, your sugar stores and everything is being stored as fat. So lots of fat storage if you have lots of insulin floating around. Leptin is secreted by your fat cells and its job is to just let your brain know how much fat body fat you have. So if you have a lot of body fat, you're secreting a lot of leptin. If you have very little body fat, you're secreting very little leptin. Where we run into trouble is insulin blocks leptin. So if you're eating a lot of sugar or a lot of carbohydrates, Leptin is never able to tell your brain, hey, we've got a lot of body fat here. So your brain actually thinks that you're dangerously skinny and that you need to eat more food. And so it makes you feel hungry even if you aren't necessarily hungry. So this is not a great place to be, obviously. Uh, glucagon is the flip side to insulin. So insulin packs away those sugars to use later. Glucagon uh, unpacks those sugars to use right now to burn as fuel. So if, if weight loss is your goal, glucagon is your new best friend. But where we run into trouble here is you can't have glucagon and insulin in your blood at the same time because they're doing opposite things. So if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, especially if you're snacking all day, your body never gets to the point where it releases glucagon and you just never get to burn that fat as fuel. You just keep storing it away. 
So cortisol, this is a stress hormone. So there's a couple of different factors at play here. First off, if you're stressed out, then you're probably going to stress eat. You know, food is an emotional thing for a lot of people, and eating uh, comfort foods is a coping mechanism. So if you're stressed, you're going to eat more. But also, what a lot of people don't realize when they're dieting, especially with low-calorie diets, is that's stressful. You're, if you aren't eating you know, enough food or enough food to support yourself, your body thinks you're starving. It thinks you're in a famine, and which stresses it out, right? And so what your body does when it's super stressed out and thinks it's in survival mode is it actually hangs on to body fat. So you may lose some weight if you go on a low-calorie diet, but you're not burning fat. You're burning muscle. Your body will preferentially burn muscle for energy as opposed to fat because it knows it needs the body fat to survive. So this is why uh, you have a hard time losing weight on a low-calorie diet, and it's just not sustainable because it screws up your hormones. So I want to make another quick point here that you can't out-exercise bad food choices. You can't have like an extra big dessert and then just go run on the treadmill for an hour because while that may burn some calories, uh, which is good, it, it's not going to do anything for your hormone levels. So balancing those out and getting those uh, in a nice uh, homeostatic state, that's key. And the way to get that is by changing the food on your plate. So number three, the guts of the matter. So obviously the main point of your digestive tract or gut is to absorb nutrients and break down food into its individual components. But what most people don't realize is it's actually crucial in terms of your immune system. The most of your immune functions happen in your digestive tract. So it's got to be healthy if you're going to be healthy. But most people don't know what really happens to their food after they take a bite and swallow it. So we're going to take a little road trip here. It all starts in your mouth, right? You take a bite of food, start chewing it up. The Obviously, the big goal here is to make big chunks into little chunks. But there's actually an enzyme in your saliva that starts breaking down carbohydrates into the little sugars. But then you swallow it down, it goes into your stomach, where your stomach acid does its job and starts breaking it into really small components. Which, quick side note here, if you have um, acid reflux, stop taking antacids. Your stomach is supposed to be acidic. It's supposed to be very acidic. If you're taking antacids, it means your stomach isn't going to be able to do its job at breaking down foods as well as it's supposed to. If you have acid reflux, the problem is not that you have too much stomach acid, is that it's not staying in your stomach. That's a neurological problem, and you need to go see a chiropractor. Okay, rant over. So after your food is in your stomach and gets broken down into its little bits, your stomach will re secrete it into your small intestine in a nice controlled little burst. In your small intestines, this is where things get their final breakdown. Carbohydrates turn into sugars, uh, proteins turn into amino acids, and fats turn into fatty acids. So a quick little point I want to make here is I don't care if you're eating a banana, a Snickers bar, or a piece of bread. Those are carbohydrates. In the end, they end up as sugars. Your body doesn't know the difference. And then the remainder of the food, after it gets absorbed through your intestines, anything left over goes into your large intestines where your body sucks out all the water. And then the last stop is, well, you poop it out. So basically, we're one big crazy straw. That's the takeaway I want you to get from this is, you know, you eat food at one end, it zigs around down into your intestines, and it comes out the back end. Food doesn't actually get into you unless it's, unless it's absorbed in your intestines. Otherwise, it's just passing on through. So leaky gut syndrome. This is a huge problem, and most people haven't heard of it. But what happens is, so, you know, I just talked about how your food is absorbed through the walls of your small intestine, right? So I'm going to use my mouse here. Hopefully you can see this. But these little bits here up here, this is all the little food particles in your small intestine. They're probably partially digested down into their indiv the individual components, but you might still have little bits of food here. What's supposed to happen is once they're fully broken down, they're grabbed by these little fingers here, absorbed in, into the cell where they're checked by your immune system. And if everything looks cool, it goes down here and is absorbed into your blood where insulin can do its thing and store it away. But where we run into some problems, if you have a lot of inflammation in your gut, you get these gaps here. So the cells are nice and tight. You have these little gaps. And then you can get uh, bacteria, toxins, undigested food, and all kinds of crud can just leak its way through and go directly into your bloodstream. That's bad because once it's in your blood, it can go anywhere in your body. This is actually where food allergies come from because let's say, for example, you ate some chicken, right? And uh, so you get little bits of chicken floating down here and you have um, this gap 
So then a tiny little chunk of chicken makes its way directly into your bloodstream. Your immune system finds it here and freaks out because it doesn't know what the heck this is. It's expecting amino acids and it's seeing whole chicken proteins. So it freaks out and uh, attacks it, but it doesn't just attack it. It flags it as a foreign invader and remembers it for later. So the next time you eat chicken, even if it's still floating around up here doing what it's supposed to be doing, your immune system remembers, hey, this thing got into our bloodstream and attacked us. And then it really freaks out and it faces the full brunt of your immune system. This makes a lot of inflammation and this is where food allergies come from. And it's from leaky gut because people are eating food that's inflammatory. So if you have, if you know this is an issue for you, then uh, please know that it is not something that you are destined to suffer with forever. You can, you can fix this. All right, so bacteria. There are uh, more bacteria in your gut than there are cells in your entire body. Pounds of bacteria live in our gut. They're a huge part of who we are. And there's good guys and there's bad guys. The good guys I like to call our BBFs, our best bacterial friends, because they're so important to our health. They help us break down food. They absorb nutrients for us. They make vitamins. They help our immune system. And they fight off the bad guys. So they're hugely important and cannot be overlooked. Uh, eating fiber helps these guys. It's, what, it's like their food. And then uh, taking a probiotic, it's like planting seeds of good bacteria. So that's an important thing to do too. The bad guys, on the other hand, uh, they help cause leaky gut and so that they can go all throughout your body then do all kinds of damage. And those come from eating the bad foods. They, they, they feed off sugar. Uh, so the best way to get rid of them is to starve them out and cut sugar out of your diet. All right, inflammation. This is the last thing I'm looking at when in terms of whether or not a food is good or bad for you. Inflammation, it sounds bad, obviously, but uh, it's actually a good thing if it's working the way it's supposed to. Uh, if you've ever like sprained your ankle or your wrist or something, you know how it gets uh, red, swollen, and hot? That's inflammation. Its job is to stop an injury and start the recovery process. Where we have some trouble, uh, trouble though, is if it's chronic, it goes on too long, or it's systemic, like it's throughout your whole body. Because basically what that means is your immune system is working way too hard, way too much, which means it's going to be less effective at doing its main job and uh, like fighting off that bug that's going around. Right now here in Illinois, it's wintertime and very, very cold. And lots of people are getting sick. Inflammation is not helping that. Uh, if you have like a stubborn injury to your shoulder, or ankle, or whatever, that's just not healing. Bodies are supposed to heal, right? So if you if something is not recovering, then you know, systemic inflammation might be a part of it. Or if you have high blood pressure or clogged arteries, that's an inflammatory process that's supposed to take care of itself. So if it's not doing its job, it's because you might have systemic inflammation throughout your whole body. You need time to change uh, change up the food. I also want to take a po moment here to point out uh, your genes and defend them a little bit. So a lot of people use bad genes as a crutch for not making better choices with their environment. Uh, but genes would take way too much of a, of, a, of a bad rap here because all your genes are are a set of possibilities. They're not your destiny. I like to say that genes load the gun, but it's your environment that pulls the trigger. So if you are in a crappy environment, and when specifically I'm talking about food here, if you're eating crappy foods, you're going to express your bad genes. If you're optimizing your food and your environment and you're living a very healthy lifestyle, you're going to express healthy genes. You have way more control over this than you think. All right, so let's go over the foods that make us less healthy first. Surprise, surprise, sugar is not good for you. This actually fails all four of a good food standards. It provides absolutely nothing to us in terms of vitamins, minerals, or nutrients. It is literally addictive. It stimulates the same part of your brain as narcotics. Uh, it screws up our gut bacteria and promotes systemic inflammation. So stay away from it. So some people might say, well, that's okay. I don't eat sugar, but I have some artificial sweetener in my sugar tea or whatever. Oh, those actually, those are kind of worse uh, because they, well, for a couple reasons. First off, they're way sweeter than anything you'll ever find in nature. Like aspartame, which is equal, or stevia, three to, 300 times sweeter than sugar. Sucralose, which is Splenda, is 600 times sweeter. sweeter. And saccharin, which is sweet and low, is 700 times sweeter than sugar. Imagine what that's doing to your brain, right? Uh, when they do studies on mice and rats, they grow huge tumors. It literally melts their brain. This stuff is horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, cut it out of your diet right away. Your body will thank you. So yeah, stay away from sugar. And if you weren't believing me that uh, sugar is bad for you, take a look at this graph. As you can see, there's a very clear and obvious uh, correlation between sugar intake and obesity. So cut it out. 
All right, next is alcohol. The same as sugar, this does nothing for you. It fails all four of your good food standards. Uh, it's addictive. It blunts your judgment in terms of the food choices you're making and probably some other decisions too, but we're not going to get into those today. Uh, it screws up your hormones. It can cause leaky gut. There's really nothing good about alcohol. So the rebuttal I often hear about this is, you know, what about red wine? You know, a glass a day is supposed to be good for you, right? Well, yes, there are some studies that show that red wine is good for you. Those studies were all done by the, the wine industry, though. And what they're actually talking about is resveratrol, which is a component found in the uh, skin of grapes. But what they don't tell you is to get the benefits of uh, consuming resveratrol is you'd have to have about 80 bottles of wine a day. So if you're really that concerned with getting your resveratrol, just eat some darn grapes and leave the wine alone. So it's at this point that I feel like I need to remind everyone that I'm not trying to ruin your life. All I'm trying to do is put all foods into the good category or the bad category. You know, at what amounts you want to let these things into your life, that's up to you where you want to draw that line. I just want to make things black and white so you can make more educated decisions. So don't get mad at me. All right, so seed oils. Uh, this fails number four of a good food standards, meaning it's very inflammatory. So uh, this, these are the oils that come from uh, seeds or vegetable oils. They come from different plants. But um, basically, they're really high in omega-6s. So a lot of people have heard of omega-3s. That's what's in fish oil. That's why people take that. It's very anti-inflammatory. Omega-6s are their opposite number. So they're very inflammatory. Uh, they're, actually, they're easy enough to avoid. Uh, you just don't cook with them, right? Uh, but where it gets uh, tricky is if you go out to eat. Restaurants love to eat these oils because they're very cheap. And they, you can cook at very high temperatures. You can reuse it over and over again. So if you're going out to eat, you're getting way more uh, of these seed oils than you think you are. And here, here's just a graph just to make that point here. That blue line that's spiking huge at the end there, that's how uh, our consumption of seed oils. Um, and that's not coming from what you and I are doing at home. That's coming from restaurants. So eating at home is definitely healthier than eating out. So grains, this is where people really start getting mad at me because people love their breads. But this fails all four of our food group uh, standards. So it's addictive because in your body it turns into sugar. Sugar is addictive. Screws up our hormones, causes inflammation and leaky gut. So it's just bad all around. Don't eat grains of any kind. I mean breads, cereals, pasta, rice, quinoa, even the gluten-free stuff. Even whole grains are bad for you. And before I get into why, I just want to point out that there is nothing that is good in grains that you're not going to get from veggies and fruit, not uh, vitamin, mineral, or fiber. And specific to fiber, there's actually four times as much fiber in fruit than there is in grains and eight times as much fiber in veggies than there are in grains. So you are going to get more fiber than you know what to do with by skipping your grains. So just to get into specifically why grains are no good, this is what uh, we're looking at when we look at the anatomy of a grain. So you got the brain on the outside. That's like the protective covering. There are some vitamins and minerals in there. Uh, the endosperm, this is like the food for the plant. Uh, it's mostly carbohydrates. And then the germ is the part that actually turns into the little plant. So if you're having refined grains, that's with the brain and the germ removed, and it's just the endosperm. Then they take the endosperm and they add sugar, salts, and fat to it. So basically what you got here is just junk food. So that's obviously not good for you. Uh, but what about whole grains, right? That's what's on my uh, box of Cheerios. So that's got to be good. Well, not so much, and it's mostly because of these two things. Most people have heard of gluten, but most people are not familiar with phytates. Phytates are, are categorized as an anti-nutrient. And what I mean is they... they they physically grab hold of vitamin and minerals and just don't let go. And we cannot absorb phytates. So that means that those that nutrition just passes on through us. Talking about, you know, that whole crazy straw analogy, just because you eat it doesn't mean you absorb it. This is what I was talking about. Those phytates just pass right on through us. And we never get to get the you know the benefits of the good stuff that is in grains because we just poop it out basically. And then now gluten, most people have heard of gluten. Uh, the gluten free foods are becoming more and more common, but uh, just to clarify what gluten actually is, it's a protein that is found in grains, and as humans, we just don't digest it very well. Uh, it, it causes a lot of inflammation in our gut, uh, which causes leaky gut, which causes you know global inflammation, which is obviously not good. Um, but what people don't know about gluten is if you've ever put up wallpaper, wallpaper paste is gluten. That's what they make it from. So the next time you go to eat a piece of bread, think about that turning into a little ball of glue in your gut and it's working its way through. And obviously it gets a little easier to see how that's maybe not such a great idea. So cut the grains. 
All right, next is legumes, which violates three and four of our good food standards, which means it screws up our hormones and it causes inflammation. So legumes means beans. So be beans, peas, lentils, peanuts, and uh, they... And the reason why those are bad is that they're similar to grains in, in terms of what they do. They cause leaky gut, systemic inflammation, screws up our, our gut bacteria. Um, and that's because of phytates. You know, it's got those anti-nutrients, so we just don't absorb them very well. Uh, most people know beans as the musical fruit, but maybe you don't know why. The reason is because we don't absorb them very well, so that they have a tendency to just sit in our intestines, where they ferment, make gas, and then we lose friends because we're stinky. Uh, but what uh, an another factor of this is the soy. Soy comes from soybeans, so they are a legume. Uh, but a lot of people associate soy uh, with tofu and it being a quote-unquote health food. This is a uh, marketing scheme. Uh, soy is not good for you. Um, and that's largely due to the estrogen. Uh, soy is a phytoestrogen, which means that our body thinks it's the female sex hormone, uh, which, guys, obviously it's not good for you and me to be having female sex hormones roaming through our blood, but even for you ladies out there, you you want that to be a normal controlled amount of estrogen, right? Uh, if you're taking, you know, um, eating a lot of soy in your diet, it's like taking random amounts of pharmaceutical estrogen with every meal. Obviously, that's not good. So uh, cut the soy. It can really do a lot of long-term but subtle damage to you. So um, even if you quote-unquote feel fine, um, soy could really be doing a number to you um, internally. Oh, and so if you're thinking, well, I don't eat beans, so I'm not getting my soybeans oil, uh, well, not so sure. I have to burst that bubble a little bit. If you start reading labels, there's soy in everything. Uh, it's because they've gotten really, really good at breaking soy down to its individual components and using that for all kinds of things. Uh, it started way back in the late 60s. You can see from this graph here, that red line is how much of uh, soybean oil we're consuming. And they're just really good at breaking that down with little bit of little bits and using it in all kinds of foods. So if you read your labels, you'll start to see how much soy is in everything, which is uh, one more reason you should avoid processed foods. And I'll explain that in a minute. So right after grains, this is where people get angry with me again when I start attacking dairy. But if you think about it, I mean, mother's milk, whether or not we're talking about human mom to human baby or mama cow to baby cow, on paper, it's it's the perfect food. You know, you get proteins, fats, and, and carbohydrates in the perfect ratio to help that child grow. But it's not just the nutrition that's coming along with that breast milk. It's also an energy-dense hormone delivery system because babies need a couple extra things. They need uh, hormonal cues from mom to help um, their immune system start uh, building up and getting more sophisticated. They also need hormonal cues from mom on how to grow. You know, babies, uh, whether or not they're cow or human, they grow exponentially in this first few months of life at a rate that we never see again. So if you think about that, I mean, would it make sense to give uh, a teenager uh, breast milk from their mom? No, I mean, that'd be weird, right? And it's just, that's for a baby, not for, an, for a young adult. Would you give an adult cow uh, baby cow milk? No, cows drink water. They don't drink milk. So then take that a step further. Does it make sense to give, um, you know, mother's milk for one species to an adult child of another species? No, I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. And then you go to start thinking about the quality of the milk that you're getting. Most milk comes from factory farms, where these cows, uh, they just stand in little tight pens all day long, ankle deep in their own feces, which makes them very sick, which means they have to be pumped full of antibiotics, otherwise they would die. So those antibiotics gets passed along into the milk. And these cows still die early, so they give them growth hormone to maximize the milk production. That growth hormone also gets packed along, passed along through the milk into uh, what we find in the store. And to make it even grosser, uh, they're hooked up to milking machines 24-7, which is irritated, irritating to their udders, so the udders get infected, and now pus and blood is getting into the milk. So that's super gross, and obviously you can't uh, feed that to people, otherwise they would get sick and die, so that's where pasteurization comes in. They heat the milk, the pussy bloody milk, to a, a temperature that kills anything in it, uh, which kills all the bad stuff, but it's also killing any of the good stuff that was in it. So now you're getting this... Uh, this quote unquote milk that has any of its nutrition or value sucked right out of it because they basically boil it before they gave it to you. So it, it's really kind of a gross thing when you think about it and it really doesn't make sense on, on any level. So cutting the milk should be, a, should be an easy one. But what about calcium? That's what people always go with this next is you got to get your calcium, right? 
Well, uh, yes, you do need calcium, but milk is actually really not a great source of it. Uh, but even if you did get adequate amounts of calcium, that has nothing to do with osteoporosis. As the United States has one of the highest rates of osteoporosis, despite having one of the highest rates of calcium. It's not just about the calcium. We're not getting all these other nutrients that we need as well. Um, but you're going to get plenty of calcium from just your eating your veggies. But if you want strong bones, it's really less about the calcium and more about picking up something heavy. Because even if you're getting adequate amounts of all the nutrients you need, your body's just not going to randomly make your bones stronger. You have to give it the cues to tell it that it needs stronger bones. And the best way to do that is to pick up something heavy. So working out's important, but not just running on a treadmill. You got to lift with you got to lift weights too. All right. So you may be thinking, okay, so I don't have that much sugar, or I don't have that much grains, but think about how it adds up. You know, think about your day's worth of meals here. I threw up these as an example of what you might have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But think about what you've eaten today and this week, this month, this year, and how that's added up your entire life. Because all this stuff has a cumulative effect. But the good news is, is you can hit the reset button pretty quickly. And that's where that 30-day uh, challenge it really becomes so valuable. 30 days to reset the button on your body, and it, it does some really amazing things for you. So, And you can do anything for 30 days. So uh, I hope you participate in the challenge with us. So, all right, so what the heck am I supposed to eat after I just went over all the bad stuff? Well, eat real food, which means meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, fruit, healthy oils, nuts, and seeds. Foods that were raised, fed, and grown naturally, and foods that are nutrient-dense with lots of occurring vitamins and minerals. This is not a diet. Get that word out of your head. You're going to eat as much food as you need to uh, look, feel, live, and perform your best. If you're too skinny, you will naturally gain weight. If you're too heavy, you will naturally lose weight. All you're doing is putting the foods in your body that your body is demanding and let your body do with it whatever it needs to do. So let's start with protein. That's the most important part of your, of your meal. It meets all four of a good food standards. You're going to get your protein from meat, seafood, and eggs. So focus here first. What I mean by that is when you're planning out a meal or a snack, start with protein and then build the rest around it. But also, if you have to prioritize where you're spending your food, start with quality protein before you move to quality uh, carbohydrates and fats, okay? And the reason for that is protein, when you say we are what we eat, that's a protein in a big way because this is what the building blocks are who we are. It becomes our skin, our hair, tendons, ligaments, muscles, hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, antibodies. It's huge, hugely important. Uh, but it's also the most satisfying. So if you're hungry and you have like a, a bag of chips, that's really not doing a whole lot to, to satisfy your hunger. But if you have like a hard-boiled egg, that does a ton to satisfy your hunger. So keep some, uh, some protein handy. Also want to clarify a couple of things here. Um, so you you see natural written on a lot of product labels nowadays, which makes it seem good, but it, it really doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, there's actually a quote-unquote natural vanilla flavoring that they get from beaver butts. I, I am not exaggerating. Somehow... Some food manufacturers have found it more desirable to get their vanilla flavoring from the butts of beavers than just the vanilla bean. I don't know why, but this is what they're doing. This is why you got to read your labels and uh, really pay attention to what you're eating. Uh, when it comes to protein, if you're in the area here in Illinois, we get uh, my wife and I have gotten our meats from uh, Walnut Acres Family Farm. They're a local farm uh, with different drop-off points in the uh, in the northern Illinois area, and they're awesome. They they take good care of the animals. You're getting quality meats. It's extremely affordable, and uh, they're just awesome people in general. So I encourage you to check them out if you're in the area. But I want to show you a quick video on uh, that'll clarify some things about organics. The way we eat has changed more in the last 50 years than in the previous 10,000. The modern supermarket has on average 47,000 products. The industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating, because if you knew, you might not want to eat it. We've never had food companies this powerful in our history. Everything we've done in modern agriculture is to grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper. If you can grow a chicken in 49 days, why would you want one you got to grow in three months? When you go through the supermarket, there is an illusion of so much of our industrial food turns out to be rearrangements of corn. Sometimes you look at a vegetable and say, okay, well, we can get two hamburgers for the same price. They have managed to make it against the law to criticize their products. There is an effort to make it illegal to publish a photo of any industrial food operation. 
I find it incredible that the FDA wants to allow the sale of meat from cloned animals without any labeling. Peanut butter contaminated with salmonella. E. coli has been found in spinach, apple juice. Smells like money to me. The average consumer does not feel very powerful. It's the exact opposite. When we run an item past the supermarket scanner, we're voting for local or not, organic or not. Look at the tobacco industry. The battle against tobacco is a perfect model of how an industry's irresponsible behavior can be changed. Imagine what it would be if, as a national policy, the idea would be to have such nutritionally dense food that people actually felt better, had more energy, and weren't sick as much. You know, now, now see, that's a noble goal. People have got to start demanding good, wholesome food of us, and we'll deliver, I promise you. So that's another awesome movie. It's called Food Inc. You can get it online in all kinds of places. Um, but I love what he said there at the end about how when you swipe a food across the scanner at a grocery store, you're voting. You're voting for the kind of world that you want to live in and that you want to raise your kids in. So it's really empowering. And that guy in the cowboy hat and glasses towards the end there, he's one of the biggest suppliers uh, to Chipotle for their meats. So the, Chipotle is one of those companies that's really uh, spearheading this efforts towards uh, responsible restauranting, which is an awesome, awesome thing to see. Okay, so uh, I mentioned eggs as being a great source of protein, and a lot of people get freaked out about cholesterol, so I want to clarify some things. Cholesterol kind of got a bad rap, along with fat. Cholesterol is not bad for you. Cholesterol is, is present in every single cell in your body. It helps insulate your neurons. It builds and maintains cell membranes. It helps you break down vitamins, and it helps you make hormones. It's a building block for all hormones. So eating cholesterol means you're going to have high cholesterol. That is absolutely not true. So the cholesterol in, that's in your body right now, 85% of it comes from your body making it. It's, it's, it's building it as a response to a couple of things. Only 15% of the cholesterol in your body comes from the food you eat. So if your doctor texts you and says that you have high cholesterol, does it make more sense to chip away at the 15% from your diet or the 85% that your body is making? And the reason why your body is making so much cholesterol is it's one of two things. One is systemic inflammation. So if you're inflamed, cholesterol is one of those ways that our body soothes inflammation. So changing the food on your plate is a great way to soothe uh, inf inflammation. But also stress. So if you are stressed, you got to make that uh, stress hormone cortisol that we talked about before, right? So the building blocks for all hormones is cholesterol. So if you have a high demand for stress hormones, that means you have a high demand for cholesterol, and your body is going to manufacture a lot of cholesterol to satisfy that demand. So don't fear eggs. Don't fear cholesterol. Just uh, clean up your diet, and everything will kind of sort itself out. All right, so veggies and fruit. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but veggies are good for you, right? So they meet all four of our good food standards. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people avoid veggies because they just don't like them and they, they want to skip them. Well, for those people, uh, you know, I unfortunately have to say too bad, you know, veggies are not optional. Uh, you know, we're adults, we mow a lawn, we pay our bills, eat your veggies. You, you got to do it if you're going to be healthy. And I don't care if they're fresh, frozen, cooked raw, whatever you got to do, just get them in your mouth. Um, what I found from talking to people, there, there's really three reasons that people avoid their veggies. And for one, it's because they're so used to these Franken foods that their taste buds just can't appreciate the natural and delicious flavors in veggies. So the good news is once you cut out all those Franken foods, your taste buds reset themselves actually pretty quickly and you'll start to appreciate veggies again. Uh, second is you're in a veggie rut. Maybe you're just like a, a peas and carrots kind of person and you don't branch out a whole lot. There are hundreds of different veggies at your grocery store. And I always tell people, every time you go in, to grab one thing that's new. And when you get home, Google it and see how to cook it and see if you like it. you always got to be trying new things, and uh, you'll never know when you discover you, the new thing that you love. And then the third thing is maybe when you were a kid, your mom you know, just served you up a canned lima beans and made you sit at the table till you finished them, uh, and you hated it. Well, the good news is we're all adults now, so uh, we can uh, cook the veggies we want in the, in the way we want. And there's a lot of tasty ways to do it. But, um, you know, fruit's good too, but veggies are mandatory. Fruit is optional. All right, so organics. So I want to clarify a couple things here. Usually when people think organics, they start thinking about produce. But really, focus your your priorities on protein when you if you have to pick and choose what you're going to get organic and what you're going to get 
uh, not organic. A good rule of thumb to follow is if you're going to eat the rind of a fruit or vegetable, like let's say an apple, then it's a good idea to get, get it organic. If it has a rind that you peel off, like an avocado or a pineapple or something, then you can get it regular. Uh, but this stuff is important. There was a study uh, recently in the Journal of Pediatrics that they checked uh, the urine sample from a thousand different kids and found the ones that had the highest levels of pesticides were the kids that had ADHD. So food does matter. You know, this has a huge impact on our overall health. But a lot of people get confused on what organic really means. So I'm going to show you a quick little video on that. So you're at the store and you're looking for something quick and easy to eat. But you're also trying to be health conscious. So instead of the regular Cheesy Mac, you go for the organic stuff. Instead of regular chicken nuggets, you grab some organic chicken nuggets. Then top it off with some organic sandwich cookies. Mmm, cookies. It's all organic, so it's good for you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not always. You see, while 45% of Americans think the organic label means healthy or good, organic really has nothing to do with how nutritious the food is for you. Organic really just defines how the ingredients were created, prepared, or raised. Let me explain. Organic means that there aren't any genetically modified ingredients. Also, organic means that no chemicals were used to kill bugs and weeds. And that all pesticides are natural instead of synthetic. And organic means nothing was fertilized with sewage sludge. Yeah, sewage sludge. Organic also means that nothing was exposed to radiation, which some manufacturers do to sterilize food. And that no industrial solvents were used to clean things up. Also, organic means there could be no chemical food additives that some foods have to make them stay fresh for an unnatural amount of time. And if it's meat, that there's no routine use of antibiotics or hormones pumped into the animals. And all this stuff is really important. But notice, organic doesn't necessarily mean that the ingredients are nutritious. So if you care about healthy foods, it's more important to just eat whole foods, mostly fruits and vegetables, and avoid packaged-like substances. And yeah, that includes organic Cheesy Mac. And here's a really big tip. If you can pronounce all the ingredients in a package you're holding, then you're on the right track. That's right. You'll, hey, find, John from you'll find that when you're eating uh, paleo that you're going to be eating very few things that are actually coming in a package. But the biggest thing to look for, if you're already eating some packaged foods, is can you just pronounce the darn ingredients? Do you know what, do you know what you're eating? All right, so let's move on to fats. Again, this meets all four of our good food standards. And uh, fat, just like cholesterol, has gotten a bad name, right? Because people think if you eat fat, you're going to get fat. On the surface, that makes sense. But in, in reality, that's just not true. Um, and for a few big reasons here. For one thing, your brain is mostly fat. And I obviously want big, big healthy brains, right? So you got to eat fat. All your hormones come from fat. Every single cell in your body has a little protective layer around it, like a soap bubble made from fat. Fat is also an excellent source of energy. So you're not going to burn sugar for, for energy. You're going to burn fats for energy. It also makes you feel full and it makes food tastier. And calories, you need it for calories. So when you're eating uh, this paleo type diet without any processed foods, processed foods are packed full of calories, mostly from carbohydrates. So if you're cutting those out of your diet, that leaves a big calorie deficit, and you're going to fill that deficit with fats. Fats are tasty, they're very healthy, and uh, they're a great source of energy. So they're a big part of uh, what you're going to be eating. It helps keep our skin healthy, enhances our immune system, stabilizes blood sugar, uh, helps our heart, normalizes cholesterol, and even prevents cancer. Most of the, um, the fear from fat comes from recommendations that were made decades ago, and that's where like the food pyramid came from. Most people don't know that that food pyramid is based 100% on lies. You can Google this. Look up Ansel Keys. Uh, this is one man who uh, falsified his research that the government based its food pyramid on, and they were just straight up lies. Uh, he basically said fat is killing us and that the opposite is true. So uh, pretty frustrating. But here's a quick little video that kind of clarifies what I'm talking about with fats. I'm responsible for writing all this and I don't believe it anymore. Now my dog gets sick, surprised us all. Ex-sportsman, lean, fit, healthy, never drank, boom, heart attack. I wanted to know why that happened. What I found shocked me. 
to the average consumer is eating less uh, fat in their diet. They are eating uh, more carbohydrate in their diet, and they've got rampant increases in obesity, diabetes, heart disease. I found out that a lot of what I thought I knew was what you can only describe as lies. I've always been very cynical about diets. For 28 days, I'm going to completely disregard the food pyramid. I'm going to gorge on fat. That's good. That's good. We've been lied to about cholesterol for long. Some people don't understand how it works. There's magic in fat. In my view, the prudent diet does not prevent heart disease. It causes it. And certainly it contributes to diabetes and obesity in a major way. I'm controlling my diabetes without treatment. Meat, fish, nuts, eggs. Those, in my view, should be the core food. We're going to prove that fat is good. I feel a lot better. I've lost a lot of weight during time without even trying. My favourite is um, a steak with nice pieces of fat on it. And, uh, I'm quite confident in 10 years' time that uh, the Western society will be embracing this uh, low-carb, high-fat concept. I'm just going to just try and get to the bottom of how I can drop dead healthy. Just don't fear fat. Love that message. Don't fear fat. If you haven't noticed, I really like these nutrition documentaries. There's a ton of good ones out there. So get on Netflix. There's a bunch of them available on there for free. Uh, a bunch on iTunes, Amazon, all over the place. So uh, use them to uh, learn and get inspired. All right. So uh, if, if you wanted more proof, this is when they made uh, the low-fat guidelines here on the left. And uh, look, it made everybody fatter. So um, start eating your fats because they're, they're, they're not what the problem is. All right, so let's eat. So when you're eating paleo, you're not going to be counting your calories, grams, ounces, blocks, or points. There's no weighing or measuring your food. Food is just supposed to be a natural, healthy part of life. So you're just going to listen to your body and do what it's telling you to do. Um, so use this as an opportunity not just to change the actual food that's going in your mouth, but change the way you eat it too. You know, Eat with your family. Eat three meals a day, starting with breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. Don't snack, especially in, in the beginning here, if you can help it, because... You know, remember that whole insulin and glucagon thing I was talking about in the very beginning here? You want to encourage glucagon to burn to burn your fat, which means no snacking. Um, and also stop eating a few hours before bedtime. There's a lot of really important stuff that happens when you're asleep, and uh, having a lot of food in your digestive tract can disrupt that. So eat dinner early. All right, so you're going to... Moving forward in the future here, you're going to be listening to your body and eating what your body is telling you to. But I'm going to give you some basic guidelines because if you're making some, some poor food choices in the beginning, you really can't trust your body right now until it detoxes everything. So starting with protein, um, this is again, this is what you are centering each meal around is protein. Start with that. Each meal should have one or two palm-sized servings of protein. Uh, so, you know, just look at your palm. That's about how much meat you should be having. If it's eggs, it's about a handful. Uh, you know, if it's something weird shaped like, you know, tuna, uh, then just you guesstimate. I don't want to hear about any of you guys using, uh, you know, shrimps to make like a, playing shrimp Tetris on your hand to figure out exactly how many you can eat. Just ballpark it, right? So, and this is the one where you really want to prioritize the food quality. Uh, if you have to, uh, you know, pick and choose where you spend your money, spend it on protein. And don't skip on this. Adequate protein is the key to this whole plan because otherwise you will feel hungry. So make sure you're getting enough protein. Veggies. Remember, veggies are really, really good for you. So put your protein on your plate and then just fill the rest of it with veggies. That's kind of it. That's really all you need to know here. Uh, changing up the different uh, veggies that you're eating and uh, using different spices will help keep things interesting. There's a ton of good res uh, recipes online. Uh, there are so many uh, paleo resources on the web right nowadays, it's ridiculous. Just Google paleo diet, check it out on Facebook. You will have more recipes than you would ever know what to do with. All right, fruit. So uh, with fruit, stick to one or two servings a day. Serving is it's about the size of a fist, so think like one apple, one orange, something like that. Um, but avoid smoothies. Smoothies it can kind of be the knee-jerk reaction that people go to when they're trying to clean up their diet. You know, smoothies, they're not inherently bad, but where, where we run into trouble is... If, well, for one thing, if, you, if you're if you making a smoothie, it's going to be more than one serving size of fruit. You're just gonna, probably going to have three or four servings of fruit in there, which that means extra sugar, right? And if you're blending it all together, that takes you know the first two steps of your digestion, your, your chewing and your stomach, pretty much out of the equation because they don't have to do anything. So that things get slammed into your system really quickly, which means an insulin spike, which is bad. 
Also, if you're used to having a lot of sugar in your diet, it can be really easy to use fruit as a crutch to prop up those sugar cravings. And this isn't just about eating good foods. We want to kill all the bad food habits. So don't uh, use fruit to, um, to maintain those, those negative habits. So just one, ser one to two servings of fruit a day. All right, fats. This is the part that you're going to play around with the most in terms of how much fat you're going to be consuming. But you want uh, at least one f fat source per meal or snack. Uh, I have some basic recommendations here, but always feel free to eat more than this, never ever less. When people come to me and saying that they're hungry and they switch to the paleo diet, they just feel like they never fall, I guarantee they haven't added fats. Uh, it's because people still have that stigma about fat, they're worried that it's going to make them fat. Not true. you got to eat your fats. It's super good for you. Really, really good for you. When we're talking about oils and butters, it's about the size of your thumb. So what is that, like one or two tablespoons? Uh, nuts and seeds would be like a closed fist. Uh, olives and coconut flakes would be like a, a heaping handful. So it's, it's more than you think. So eat lots and lots of fats. All right. So again, your mileage may vary. You, you need to play around with the quantities here. What I gave you were just very basic guidelines. You need to put on your thinking cap and see how your body responds to it. All right, so going forward, for 30 days, you are going to eat nothing but paleo. Be very strict. Flip your diet upside down. I used to tell people, you know, it's just okay just to dip your toe in the water and gradually make changes. I don't do that anymore because you know what? Making small changes, let's say you just cut out grains but you leave everything else the same, it's it's really annoying, you know, and you're really not going to see that great of results and you're going to give up on it and be sick of it. Um, but if you switch everything over to paleo, you're going to see dramatic results and you're going to see results very quickly. And there is no motivator like results. And so <clears throat> you're going to eat foods that make you more healthy. That's meat, seafood, eggs, lots of veggies, some fruit, and plenty of fats. Avoid sugar, alcohol, grains, legumes, and dairy. Do not try to make uh, paleo junk foods. So like no paleo pizza or paleo desserts, at least for the 30 days. And that's for a couple reasons. Uh, part of it is we're trying to you know, change your food habits, right? But also the the paleo junk foods, they're not as good as the real thing. You know, paleo pizza is pretty good, but it's not as good as regular pizza. And if you're, you know, just relying on that this whole time, you're just going to be disappointed and you're really not going to, you know, benefit from the spirit of the challenge, which is to reintroduce your relationship to food and not just make healthier versions of junk food. And also don't step on the scale. The scale is a really, really bad indicator of your health. For example, back when I made all these nutritional changes, uh, I didn't gain or lose a pound, but my my body composition totally changed. I lost a lot of fat. I was very like, I didn't have like a gut, but I was just squishy all over, very soft. And uh, then I put on a whole bunch of muscle and um, lost that fat. So my, my clothes fit totally, totally differently. I looked way differently. I felt way differently. But according to the scale, it was a failure. So just don't even get on the scale. Pay more attention to how you feel, how you look, how your clothes are fitting. Those are much better indicators of your progress. All right, so just get started. Look at your calendar, pick 30 days, and just go forth. Uh, go home, go to the, the kitchen and your pantries and get rid of all the junk food because you don't want that staring at you in your face when you're going through your challenge. Donate to the food pantry. Uh, and then uh, go out and do some shopping. Find some recipes, plan it out. Organization is the key to this. Uh, what my wife and I do is we take Sunday afternoon to chop all the veggies and uh, as much meal prep as we can do. Uh, it just takes us like an hour or two, and then we have like nothing to do for the rest of the week when we're actually busy. It, it's proved to be really effective at keeping us consistent and uh, stress-free during the week. And uh, also, um, get your spouse on board. Uh, this is really hard to do by yourself. And if you've got kids, uh, make them eat paleo too. Uh, they'll benefit from it even more than you will. And uh, you're not a short order cook. What you meet, what you make is what is good for the whole family, right? So get get the whole gang on board. All right, so what you can expect. For the first week, maybe the first two weeks, uh, you may feel crummy. Uh, it's called the carb flu. It's because when you cut all these sugars out of your diet that your body is used to running on, uh, you can feel a little cruddy. You can be a little grouchy. You might feel um, tired. It's, think of it like a detox. If you're getting rid of all the, the crud in your body, it's it's not going to feel great, but that will pass. And um, in this next chunk for the second week there, you're going to start feeling better, but you might have some digestive issues. And so this may be because you're eating a lot more fiber than you're used to. So make sure you're upping your water intake as well. Otherwise, just you'll get backed up from all the fiber. So lots of water. 
And then for the second half of the challenge, you're going to feel awesome. This is when your skin starts clearing, allergies go away, uh, those aches and pains that you've gotten used to, they start clearing up, more energy, clothes are fitting better, you're looking better, you're going to start getting compliments from people on how, all the, how you're looking different. Uh, the second half is when the magic happens. So go forward, be strict for 30 days. This is the, we're hitting the reset button on your health here. How strict you want to be after that, that's up to you. But the whole point of this is by cutting everything out of your diet is when you start reintroducing things, you may notice, you know what, you know, grains really aren't that big of a deal for me. I seem to feel okay on them. And you may choose to have grains here and there in, in, in your day-to-day -day life. But maybe you'll discover that, that dairy just knocks you out and you want to make sure you avoid dairy. Or maybe that, uh, you know, dairy, desserts really screw you up. So you want to make sure if you're going to have a dessert, it's going to be a really awesome dessert. You're not going to waste it on like an Oreo cookie or something cheap and crummy. You want to make sure if you're going to eat dessert and feel a little cruddy, that you're going to eat, get something awesome. So this is a big part of this too, is changing your relationship with food going forward. So the apple pushes you towards health. The donut pushes you away. That's the reality that I really want you to take home today. Um, you know, we're producing the the, the sickest kids uh, in the in the history of the human species. Uh, we have more kids with obesity, diabetes, cancer, acne, attention issues, depression, autism than a species has ever seen, ever. Genetics don't change this fast. This is not genes. This are is lifestyle choices. So think about it. If your if your body was your house and your house was on fire, who would you call? Fire department, right? And they'll come with the tool tools they have, the fire hoses and axes, which is, you know, drugs and surgery. And they'll smash out the windows and smash down your door and they'll smash into the walls and they'll soak everything down with the fire hose and put out the fire. And if you called them on time and they were quick to respond and didn't make any mistakes, is it possible that they'll save the life of your house? Absolutely. And you should be eternally grateful for that. But what about when they leave? You've got a mess now, right? Who would you call at this point? Would you call the fire department to get your house back in order? Would the same tools used in an emergency to stop it from dying be the same tools used to restore it to homeostasis and balance? Or would you need someone with an entirely different set of expertise? And if all you've got is drugs and surgery, how can you tell me that you're about health, wellness, and prevention? You need someone with a completely different set of skills here. Because this is what we're spending on medical care. Heart disease, half a billion dollars. Cancer, 430 million. Digestive issues, 337. I mean, the numbers add up to ridiculous amounts. This is from 2002. It's $3.5 billion. Today, it's probably double. And this is what we're spending per day. So don't you dare tell me that organic food is expensive. This is expensive. And this is our, our choices that are getting us here, not our bad genes, bad luck, or bad germs. I mean, is, is there ever going to be a drug or miracle pill that's going to solve the problem of not feeding ourselves or our children the proper nutrition? What pill is ever going to counter the damage of being sedentary? Is, I mean, is there ever going to be a drug or surgery that will solve the problem of, teaching, of not teaching our children how to love themselves and deal with adversity, that they're not respected and honored, that, and that we don't respect and honor ourselves? There's no greater gift that you can give your kids in being a role model. So make sure that they see you eating clean. What if I told you that there was something you could do that would decrease your chances of dying from anything by 67%, that it decreased your chances of dying from anything by half in just the elderly, that it would prevent up to 47% of cognitive impairment, 62% of Alzheimer's, and 52% of dementia, that it would increase the physical function in older adults and decrease your chances of ever being in a nursing home? What would you say? Sounds pretty awesome, right? Guess what? It's just taking a 15-minute walk once a day. Make it part of your family tradition is every day after dinner, you take a 15 minute walk, you bond as a family and you get all these benefits and you're teaching your kids a healthy lifestyle. So, you know, I'm a chiropractor. So, you know, why is a chiropractor talking about nutrition? It's because both things have to do with restoring proper function. Because if your body isn't able to efficiently process the nutrition that you're putting into it, it, it just puts a ceiling on the, the, the state of the health that you can achieve. It's like putting, you know, uh, awesome gas in a Ferrari that has a bad engine and because as a chiropractor I'm working with your nervous system and that's controlling how everything in your body is functioning so you can putting the, the best food in the world into your body but if you're if your nervous system isn't working at a hundred percent capacity then you're just not going to be able to use that food as efficiently so what chiropractic does in a nutshell is it helps you get healthy stay healthy and enhance your quality of life so you can live life to your full potential that's what I do so you know, this is what I like to tell people. This is kind of our motto here at Hanson Family Chiropractic. 
we are not a doctor's office. We are a tribe. We are a lifestyle. We are a movement. Prioritizing our health helps us to live life to our full potential. That's what the people that come to our office are doing. They're living their life to its full potential, and they're seeking out everything they can do from a healthy lifestyle standpoint to uh, to live the best life that they can. And that's what I am honored to do as a chiropractor is help them do that. So if you are in the area and you want to talk to somebody about how to live your best life possible, please give us a call. If you are not in the area, please contact us anyway, and I will find a chiropractor near you who can help you reach your life goals. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thanks for tuning in.